Hey everyone, I hope you're all doing really well. My name is David Beebe. Welcome back to the Solo YouTube channel and to another free lesson. If you're new to the channel, Tom Quayle and I built a cool, unique app for developing your fretboard knowledge and changes playing. And every week on this channel, we do free lessons on fretboard visualization, practicing, and how to get the most out of the Solo app. So if you're interested in seeing more of these video lessons, be sure to subscribe to the channel, click the bell icon to be notified of when Tom and I post them. Now today, we're gonna to be looking at a very powerful way to practice scales. And in my opinion, one of the most important exercises that you can do to develop solid yet flexible scale-based fretboard knowledge. And so this lesson is gonna be broken up into two parts. The first, I'm gonna explain the basic concept and the exercises on the fretboard. And then the second, I'm gonna show you the different ways that you can set up solo to help organize, guide, confirm, and challenge what you're practicing. I am making one small assumption of those of you watching this video, and that's you understand what intervallic functions are. Now, if you don't, do not worry. We have a basic, simple video explaining this from the ground up on the channel. You can click somewhere around here to watch it or follow the links in the description below. It's actually also in the Solo app in the tutorials videos section. So you can check it out there too. Watch that video, get up to speed, and then come back to this lesson. Okay, let's cut to the close-up cameras and we shall get started. So much like in the lesson from a couple of weeks ago where we were looking at new ways to target and visualize arpeggios and chord tones, today we're going to be reevaluating some common traditional ways of practicing and learning scales and trying to maybe add to them and put a new spin on the way we do things that can really help us powerfully, um, as the title of this video may say if I edit it this way, uh, to genuinely break out of the dreaded boxes. So this phrase, breaking out of the boxes, it's often used and is perhaps overused to the point where we might think of it as a bit of a cliche or a meme or possibly not even true. Now I do think it is a genuine issue that people have and it's one that they talk about in terms of being stuck within the, the box shape that the scale pattern creates. So our old favorite A minor pentatonic, between these frets here, this sort of box that's created, is a trap that we get stuck in for our improvisation and phrasing and lines. Now, I don't think that the problem is so much that we need to break out of these boxes, but more that we need to have a deeper understanding of what's inside of them. Oh, what's in the box? If I can see and control the small universal components of what make up a scale, i.e. its intervals or intervallic functions as we call it in solo, then much like Neo's spoons in the Matrix, we come to the realization that there are no boxes. Whoa. Now, what's working against us is that the common and traditional ways to map out and organize the fretboard, like the uh, aforementioned pentatonic two note string patterns, or perhaps the three note string patterns, so the major scale that we might have, um, or the cage system, albeit to a lesser extent with that one. These all encourage multi-octave and difficult to manage chunks of muscle memory. Now, as a caveat here, I'm not saying for one moment that caged or pentatonic boxes or three note per strings themselves are bad or they shouldn't learn them or they're not good visualization systems. Uh, they actually have some fantastic advantages that can help develop your vocabulary, uh, motivic plane, and your technical uh, finger dexterity and speed, and so on and so on. But with all that said and out of the way, they do encourage an understanding of the start note and the end note of a box pattern. So with the air minor pentatonic, we have the start note and the end note. That's often understood. But everything else in between, the remaining note names and intervals between these two distant anchor points, this can be very hazy, slow to access, or just flat out not known. And it's this weak, weaker knowledge and the dodgy muscle memory that creates our fabled box traps. And I think doing it this way over and over can lead us to these areas of repetitive or predictable phrasing, and I guess ultimately frustration for us as players. So instead, what I suggest we want to do is to map out and learn and practice our scales in relation to how the intervallic functions, these notes within the scale, look like against the root note. And very importantly, this is the key part here, is that we practice multiple pathways and multiple ways 
of finding each of those intervallic functions whilst we're ascending and whilst we're descending. So let me show you what that looks like in practice on the guitar, then we'll turn our attention to solo and show you how solo can help organize this and confirm what we're doing. So I am assuming here that you understand what intervallic functions are and that you've done some work in learning what they might look like on the fretboard. Don't worry if you haven't, they're included within Solo in the PDF file to show you how to find these. And in fact, if you've done any of my Pathways to Jazz courses or Tom's uh, Visualizing the Fretboard tutorial, uh, we go through and sort of teach how to find and look at all these different intervallic functions. It's not the point of this lesson, um, but I will be doing enough so this all makes sense as we go through the scale exercise. So let's arbitrarily choose a scale and a root note. So we're gonna choose the Aeolian scale, so natural minor, and we will stick with the root note of C for now. So we'll start by finding the root note on the low E string. So that's a C on the low E, that's be the eighth fret here, like this. Now what I'm gonna do is first of all play the octave shapes. So these are fairly straightforward, and most people will know an octave, and this would be what I class as ascending to the octave shape one. Now I'm going to play another way of finding that octave, which would be this. So I'm skipping some strings here and doing this. So this would, for me, be uh, octave shape two, ascending. Okay, now I'll go back to the first one again. So as you can see here, I'm moving position. I'm literally breaking out of any perceived mental or physical boxes because I'm visualizing here my octave shape here and then an octave shape here. And this is the start of this C Aeolian scale. So now we'd move on to the next scale degree or intervallic function that's in Aeolian. So this would be the two, okay? Now I can see the two here. But before I go on to the flat three, which would be my traditional way of practicing the scale in sequential order, I'm gonna try to see the additional way that I can uh, see the two. So that would force me out of this box way of thinking and then having to fret the below the root note with the, the pinky finger and find the two here. So that would be the other way I've cataloged finding the two. So I've got the two here and then here. Okay, so now I've done the two, I move on to the flat three. Okay, so I know I go back again to this first way where my index finger's on the root and I do the flat three. So now I'm gonna find the flat three in the other way. So it would be, I change fingering again, I've moved back out of this position and I'm going flat three here. Uh, then I move on to the four. So I would have the four like this. Now I don't catalog it this way, but if you've got big stretchy fingers, you can do the four here for like some sort of stretch pentatonic thing. That would be a four. Um, then we have the five. And then the five, another way that you can visualize it ascending is like this. Okay, then we break back again and go to the flat six. So flat six, shape one, ascending. And flat six, shape two, ascending. Then the flat seven, shape one, ascending. I catalog only one of them. So then we back at this point to the octave, shape one, ascending, finish it off with the octave shape two, ascending again. So if I do that a little bit faster for you and still talk it through, I've got my octave shape one, octave shape two, and then I've got the two, ascending shape one, two, ascending shape two, flat three, ascending shape one, flat three, ascending shape two, got the four, got the five, ascending shape one, five, ascending shape two, flat six, ascending shape one, Flat six, ascending shape two. Flat seven, ascending shape one. And then the octave shape again, we're back to the start. And then octave shape two. So this is doing a couple of things. Let's do many things actually. First of all, from a visual and a mapping perspective, we are practicing this in a very fluid, dynamic way that we can maneuver different pathways through the same scale. And we're learning that all at once. Secondly, we're developing an oral awareness of where the root is and what the intervals sound like against the root note. So that's building the sound of the scale within our ears. And then finally, it's given us a very localized awareness, of this one octave um, little chunk that is gonna be able to be mapped and moved across the entire fretboard. So the system of practice that I would suggest you do is you do it from this one root note on this string, then we move to the A string, 
and find the C root note. And we do the same exact process. We drill through this in the same manner. And this reinforces what we've already been learning. So I find my root note. I've got my root note C here. So I do my octave shapes. Now here I have to compensate for the tuning of the guitar, of course, because the actual octave shape two is this. So I have to compensate for my standard tuning here. If you're in fourth tuning, this wouldn't be a problem, but uh, we do have this extra little quirk and work, bit of work to do for a standard tuning, guys. So then I do the octave shapes. And I do the two. The other way. And the flat three. Flat three. And the four. And the five. And the five for the other. Flat six. Flat six. Flat seven. And then the root again. Then you would take that process through the remainder of the strings. So you find the C root note on the D. You do the same thing again. You find the uh, the root note on the on on the G string, and then the B string and the C string, and you map that process through the entire fretboard. And because of the transposable uh, repeating nature of the guitar, other than the compensation that we have to make for the tuning, everything just is the same. So this one localized octave chunk enables you to really dynamically map and play the scale fluently throughout the entire fretboard. So what this results in after you know, much, much practice is that it doesn't matter where you are, so long as you can see a root note, you'll be able to see all of the other intervals around it that make up the given scale. So in this case, C Aeolian. So then the next thing you'd want to do is practice descending, so coming back the other way. So you're learning to descend to the intervallic functions within the scale. So if I find the root note on the D string, 10th fret here. Okay, so I'm going to do my flats, visualize my flat seven, descending shape one. So I'm going to descend to the flat seven with the first shape. And I'm going to do the second shape. Okay, now I'm going to descend to the flat six, do shape one. Then to the flat six, shape two. I'm going to descend to the five. Okay, then I'm going to descend to the four. And the other way to descend into the four. I'm going to descend to the flat three, and the other way, then to the two, then to the octaves. And again, you can drill that through from every root note, okay? Some places you're not going to be able to complete the octave, of course, because if you start descending from the C on the, uh, on the A string, you're obviously not going to be able to complete that unless you've got seven or eight strings. But you could even in your mind mentally just imagine where those other notes would be on, on a virtual or imaginary seven or, or eight string, that the, the shapes remain the same. This is the beautiful nature about this two point um, uh, visualization system. Okay, so let's set up solo to guide us through the process, uh, check on what we're doing, and actually give us some interesting extra challenges to really test how we're learning this. So I've got the Aeolian scale, I'm in the scale trainer, I've got Aeolian loaded and the starting root note of C, and we're going to be ascending for now, leaving the melodic sequence as it is, and the root note, the root sequence is static. Uh, let's hit start. So I'm going to start on my low E string, and I'm going to play the root notes. Now at the moment, Solo is only listening for the first correct note. Um, and there will be some updates in the future that um, get around that, and so it's listening for additional notes. Um, but for now, you can use the first note that Solo is checking for the confirmatory process, and then your ears can lock on as you do the second shape. You can test yourself there. So I'll now play the two. So I've got, um, now remember, I go back to the root, so I play the root note again, and obviously Solo isn't listening for that now, so it's not gonna do anything. But I get the reference point again of what the root is. So I have the root. <laughs> Then the two, it's checked it off. I do the second way and I check it with my ears. So, okay, that's the same. Then I'm gonna go and do the flat three ascending shape one. And the next, the other one. And go on to the four. And the five. Five has another one, so. Okay, and then the flat six. Checked it off, and the other flat six, and the 
flat seven. And then the one again. Okay, and it's rolled back around to C and we can do that again on the next, on the A string, go all the way through all the, all the strings. Um, we can then of course uh, come out of that and do it descending. So if we do it down, it's now gonna give us the, looking at the flat seven. So we do the same process, um, but descending. So we've got the root note, if I start on the 10th fret of the D string, so we've got the octave shape there. Then I look for the flat seven descending shape one. And I can look for the second shape of that. Check it with my ears. Look at the flat six descending shape one. Descending shape two. I can check it with my ears. All the diagrams with the PDF file if you're working with that. Then the uh, five. And then the four. And the four. Second shape. The three descending shape one. And the three descending shape two. And we got the second. And then back to the octave. And then we back around again, and you can do the descendings from each of the root notes on each of the strings. Now the other cool things that we can do with solo here to sort of test and probe the stress points is um, coming out of here again, we can randomize the internal intervallic functions. So it's still gonna start with the root note, still gonna be listening to that to begin with, but now it's gonna randomize them in between. So starting with the root notes, I've got, and then I'm gonna find the twos, okay? And now it's gone to the flat six. So again, I have to, depending on where I am, I can either go back to the original uh, position or I can stay with this uh, little finger anchored. And this is now up to us. As long as I play both of them, it doesn't really matter. So I might go now, the flat six, but start with ascending shape two. So it's triggered that one, and I go to the first one. I'm gonna do the four. Flat three, shape one, shape two. And I've got the five, and I'll start with the second ascending shape now. In the, in the first shape. And I've got the flat seven. And I'll finish on the one. The other thing that solo can do is to not always start from the root. So I can go to the melodic sequence and say I want to start it and go from the third note of the scale to the third note of the scale. Uh, again, you can apply this to randomization or just going up or down, and it's going to massively just probe where all your weak spots are um, for visualizing these intervallic functions. So by practicing this way, you're developing an extremely unbiased a method for visualizing and mapping out all of the intervallic functions and scale degrees that make up Aeolian. And it doesn't matter what the root note is because those two point shapes and ways of visualizing the intervallic functions stay the same. What you end up with if you, when you've worked on this in, um, a lot in lots of different contexts and you know different scales and root notes is that you can just target things at will regardless of where you might be. So it's a little bit of a silly daft party trick or a gimmick but if I think of C Aeolian I can irrespectively of you know any kind of boxes or any kind of large multi octave shapes I can just think of it like this. I can think of here's my C. So there's my uh, flat three, flat seven, flat six, one, two, flat three, flat six, flat seven, five, four, one, flat three, flat six, two, one, flat six, flat seven, flat three, four, one. Um, I can do that. Yeah, if it wasn't for the fact that it takes long to spit it out of my mouth, I can play, do that as fast as I want to. Um, it becomes almost trivial to be able to see um, and map out and visualize any uh, scale on the guitar in a very free, liberating way. Okay then, so there's one final thing I wanna mention before we begin wrapping up this lesson. And this is extremely useful for any visualization exercise that you might do on the instrument. And that is to look at your hand, look at the neck, and to vocalize out loud what it is that you're doing. Now, you might say, well, why do I need to do this? I can do it in my head. I don't need to say it out loud. But what I found in all my years of practicing myself and, uh, and teaching is that 
Give the mind a chance and it will wander off and do its own thing. And what you'll be finding is that your, your hand will be drilling the physical muscle memory and you won't be thinking about what it is that you're practicing. And that has been half the battle in all of these exercises and we've been talking about. Is we need to want to be thinking about what we're doing. So looking at your hand and then paying attention to the line of sight that the shape makes between the root note and the intervallic function and then saying it out loud. So as an example, if I play the third from A, so if I take this A root note here, and then I say, look at my hand and say, this is the third. And then I would also say the cataloging that I've given it as well. So I catalog this as ascending shape one. So I would say, this is the third ascending shape one. And I'd look at my hand as I do it. And this is just gonna just sear it into your mind, burn it into your brain that little bit stronger by sitting on it and dwelling on it for a little bit and not rushing through it, it's gonna be much more ingrained into your memory. Okay guys, that's all for this week's lesson. It's a bit of a long one, I know, but I hope it was interesting and useful to you. And like I said up front in the introduction, this is one of the most powerful things you can do to develop solid and flexible scale knowledge on the instrument. If you don't have Solo yet, you can get it now in the iOS App Store. It's available for iPhone, iPad, and Apple Silicon Macs. And we're inching ever closer to the now infamous Android version. Uh, so hang in there and thanks for your patience. Do let us know how you got on with this exercise. And if you have got any questions about it, drop them in the comments below. And I'd also be curious to know what are your other favorite ways of practicing scales on guitar or bass. Thanks for watching this video. Don't forget to like it, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell icon to be notified of when we post more lessons like this. My name is David Beebe, and until next time, bye-bye.